Hi, Dave. Hi, Mike. Um, Hi. It is raining very hard here. Uh, yeah, it's it's eased off a bit here since actually, but um, it's still raining. Okay. All right, I'm going to start in about two or three minutes, Mike. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Just, well, uh, how do you want? How do you want to play it? Are you going to? Uh, well, I'll do my I'll do my bit first if you want, because I'm going to sell promote the observatory and that, and then oh yeah yeah I'll go through a few pickies and then we'll um over to you, Mike. Yeah, okay. I'll yeah. See, I can uh, I can make yeah. it anything from uh, twenty minutes, half an hour. Yeah, okay. Do well, an hour still, if you want. Yeah, <laughs> as I said, Mike, we're we're aimed to for the, for nine uh, for eight thirty. Sorry, yeah, that'll be fine. And if there's no sign of improvement in the weather, we'll uh, we'll do it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Is there just Mike with you, did you say? Yeah, Mike Hutchins, yeah. 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 Okay, speak to you in a little while. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the Norman Lockyer Observatory um, live streaming session. Ah, and as you can probably see at the bottom of the page here, um, 
we've got heavy rain here. Um, yeah, very heavy rain, a bit depressing really. Um, I'm your host tonight, Dave Alexander. We've got Mike Hutchings here and over in Tynmouth, we've got Mike Curran. Um, Mike's currently saying that the rain's easing, but there's still a lot of cloud. Um, the, the weather's coming from uh, Mike's direction. Basically, what we will do is we're just going to go through and talk through some of our pictures. Um, then I'll hand over to Mike. Mike will also uh, chat um, and talk to you about some of his pictures. Uh, and then if there's no improvement by 8.30, then the plan is that we will, we will shut down. Okay, so I'm at the Norman Locker Observatory. This is being done in conjunction with the Sidmouth Science Festival. Um, the festival ends this Sunday at the observatory. There's a family science day. Um, children 17 or under getting free, adults at 10 pound. Um, there's a virtual reality journey in the space. There's Leonardo formerly Westland Helicopters, they have um, uh, simulators. There's uh, Mars Rover and Moon Rovers uh, from the Institute of Physics. Uh, and there's lots of hands-on uh, experiments for the youngsters to do. And we do have the rocket cars, which are very exciting and well worth seeing. And I think they're on our YouTube as rocket cars as well. Okay, so straight away, Nothing's happened. Ah, what will not be happening tonight? Well, you're going to get an introduction, but I doubt if you're going to get um, live streaming from 10 past eight. Uh, no point in uh, visiting our telescope and streaming equipment, uh, unless you've got a pair of water wings or some big fishing wellies, because you're going to need them. Um, so I'm sorry you won't be picking an object. Uh, and please be patient as we are learning how to, to use Zoom and YouTube. And my, my, my wife has said to me, I've got to smile a lot, stop picking my face and all these other things. Okay, about the, the, the normal Locker Observatory itself, uh, we're a charity um, membership um, for an individual per year is 25 pound or 40 pound per year per couple. There are members nights every Friday. What I would say to you, um, these members nights are streamed um, over our uh, over Zoom. Um, so it's free entry to the open evenings. Um, you will get training if, if and we do encourage people to come if they can. Um, we do have some members, Manchester, places like that. They come down here regularly on holiday. They will come and visit us. Um, we do encourage you to visit, but we are happy when you're here to give you training on our use of our historic and obviously our more modern telescopes. Um, <clears throat> we will give you guidance on uh, imaging. Uh, if you live locally, we have ad hoc um, observing sessions. You will get basically a, a message to saying we'll be open tonight and you can come up. You can bring your own equipment. You can use some of the equipment here. Uh, there are other interest groups uh, associated with um, the observatory. The most notable is uh, the cosmology group, which is run by Mike Curran, who's online tonight. Um, I don't pretend to understand some of the things that they talk about. It's pretty um, deep, but I do have to say that the, the briefing pack that uh, Mike puts out once a month is pretty impressive. Okay, what would you have seen tonight? Well, or, or, sorry, what we are using the setup tonight, well, we're not using, would have been um, our Celestron uh, 11 and a quarter inch um, on a proper pillar um, using a ZW OASI 533 uh, one-shot color camera. Um, and we use this, this piece of kit, which is getting rave reviews and uh, is being used to just about everybody. Um, it is basically, it's the ASI Air. Um, it's uh, basically a Raspberry Pi with a transmitter. 
uh, only a short range transmitter of about 30 meters, um, contains lots of useful um, uh, software and it does plate solving. So it's go to um, and tracking is, is um, superb, very good indeed. We did have a clear night on Tuesday. Um, yeah, we did. And um, we saw Comet uh, 12P Ponds Brooks. Um, the P, by the way, stands for periodic. Um, and this is being dubbed the Millennium Falcon Comet because those of you who are into Star Trek, actually it might be a bit tricky as well, but, but you can see the, the shape here. Hopefully you can see this. Um, these two prongs, yeah, somebody just shouted Star Wars. Again, here, a bit clearer and here, but yes. So we did see that um, on Tuesday night. Uh, we stacked some images uh, and we will be making them available. We also saw um, the globular cluster M13 in Hercules. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's a nice binocular object. It's one of the brightest globular clusters in the night sky. Um, it's impressive whether you're using binoculars or a telescope. The bigger the telescope, the more stars that uh, will be resolved. But uh, yeah, so we, we saw that. And we also saw, courtesy of Mike Caron, um, M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, this is a picture that I took. Um, most of the images you will see, no, in fact, all of the images you will see will have been taken by myself, Dave Alexander, by Mike Curran, uh, and all people here based at the observatory um, through the um, one of the observatory telescopes. Um, yeah, very nice um, galaxy. Um, there are two satellite galaxies here. One's not very obvious here. And one is very obvious there. Um, and one's M32. And I can't remember what the other Messier number is for this one. But yeah, and that was, this was only uh, 30, uh, 30, 60 minute exposures. So that's only um, half an hour's worth of exposure. But already you can see a lot of the details coming out. Um, <clears throat> some of the things that I've been taking images of. Um, I'm known as uh, the open cluster guy. If people want to talk about open clusters and globular clusters, they will, they will come to me. Um, and this is one of my favorite globular clusters after M13 in Hercules. There is M92 in Hercules, which is very underrated, well worth it. There's also M15, a nice binocular object, globular cluster in uh, Pegasus. Um, this one is in Can Venetici. Uh, the age of this, this cluster is 11.4 billion years old, and it's at a distance of 33,900 light years. These are believed to be the remains of galaxies that were forming around about the same time as our galaxy. Uh, <clears throat> our galaxy grew quicker um, and disrupted the formation uh, of the other galaxies forming around it to a point where the lighter gaseous and stable stars were absorbed into um, to our uh, galaxy. Um, the heavier uh, stars were left behind. They suffered a core collapse. Uh, and you're talking really about hundreds of thousands of stars in a very, very small distance. I think in one of the clusters, might be this one, I think you're talking about 90 light years across so absolutely, yeah, yeah, rich with stars. This is uh, M27, uh, another uh, image um, <clears throat> by myself um, that I took, um, Constellation Vulpecula. It's called the Dumbbell Nebula, and it lies uh, at a distance of 1,360 light years away, and its age is 14,600 years. At this core is a white dwarf star. Now, when I say the age, that is the age of the, the nebulosity. Um, the star obviously is a lot older than that. What will happen over time that to this shell of gas will eventually dissipate over time 
leaving just the, the white poor, uh, the, the, the white dwarf star. This will happen um, at some point um, to our sun. Um, our sun will start to shed um, layers uh, of the atmosphere and become a planetary nebula. But um, in case you, you're getting worried, cancel your holidays or what have you, um, we've got uh, a few billion years yet before that happens. As I said, I'm the, the open cluster guy. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is M67 open cluster in Cancer. The famous cluster in Cancer is M44, uh, the beehive cluster, which is visible under moonless conditions to the naked eye. Um, this one, I, and it's quite impressive but as a binocular object. This one is a binocular object, um, small telescope object, but the larger the scope, the more you get out of this cluster. And this is something interesting about this cluster because initially it was believed this was a globular cluster. The age of the stars fit the profile. It's a very old cluster. 3.2 billion years old, although some estimates say it could be as old as 6 billion years. So it fits the, the profile of a globular cluster. Um, and it's unusual because a lot of these older open clusters get scattered as they move the, through the, uh, the, the, uh, the arm, spiral arm of the galaxy that it's in it has gravitational interactions and the stars are scattered. This is unusual because this group is still very, very compact, even after 3.2 billion years. But recent adv advances in um, uh, working out the distance of these things, they now realize this thing is only 2,800 light years away. So this is very close to us and therefore, well within the, um, the realms of our galaxy. Globular clusters tend to exist outside of our galaxy, uh, roughly in a halo. Uh, the, most, the bulk of them are seen in the, uh, during the summer period, but there are a few now disappearing and appearing, turning up in the winter, winter night sky. <clears throat> so yes, so yeah, let's go on. Uh, this is um, NGC 281. Uh, NGC is the new general catalog. Um, this was compiled from information put together by uh, William and Caroline Herschel. This is in the constellation of Cassiopeia. This is 9,500 light years away. Um, <clears throat> this is a H2 region. It's being excited by an illuminated by a very, very large star. And it's been a very large star and a very young, very hot star. So this is heating up this gas, exciting the gas, which in turn is glowing. Yes, okay. And this would have been done with my eight inch uh, Celestron HHD using a dual, dual band filter. And the rain's getting harder, sorry everybody, but it's really banging down now. Um, this is one of my, my favorite pictures. Um, <clears throat> this was taken with a wide field refractor, a little a Williams Optic ZS73. And the thing I like about this, you get two. You get two nebulas for the price of one, uh, or you get two uh, objects for the price of one. Down here, you have got um, a hydrogen H2 region. And I hope you can see this, you've got the bubble nebula. So again, this is a uh, gas uh, that's being excited by a nearby hot young star. So yeah, so you've got this again, this would have been observed, I would have observed this um, uh, using a hydrogen, uh, uh, sorry, a dual band filter. But the pleasing thing about this is you've got this lovely open cluster up here, Messier 52. This is um, 
<clears throat> Actually, that's wrong, isn't it? It's not 35 million years. So. Yeah, no, that's right. So, yes, yeah, so this is um, 4,600 light years, years away on the border between Cassiopeia and Cepheus. The stars here are around 35 million years old. So they are very, very young stars indeed. Um, and the interesting thing is this cluster has been observed to contain well over 6,000 stars. But yes, yeah, so this, this is a very nice object. Um, it is possible um, through a medium sized to small telescope to see the nebulosity associated here. Um, this picture, I, I think you're all gonna know what it is. You've got the horse head nebula here. You've got the flame nebula here. This is in Orion. This bright star is Alnitak. This is part of Orion's belt. That is Alnilam. And then the third star is Mintaka. But the unusual thing about this is that um, I just, one evening, I was just out in the garden. I bought myself a Canon 200D digital SLR camera. Um, and it came with, um, uh, uh, I think it was an 18 to 55 millimeter lens. Um, so I put the lens on the camera, I ramped it up uh, and I took a number of images. I took round about two and a half minutes worth of images, no filter, no nothing. And I stack the, those images. And to my astonishment, because I was not expecting anything, um, I, I got this. I got this. I got the horse head and the flame nebula. So, yeah, I was well pleased. And the point I'm trying to make to you is that um, for astronomy, you need your eyes. You can do astronomy with your eyes. You can do astronomy with binoculars. If you haven't got a telescope or you've got a camera, a digital SLR camera, just go out, put the lens that you bought that, that came with it, just put the lens on it and just put it on a tripod. If you've got a cable release, shutter release cable, great. And just take some short duration exposures, five or 10 seconds, mess around with the, um, the ISO till you get something that's suitable. Don't use automatic focus, use manual focus. You can get software now for most of the major cameras so that you can actually control your camera from your PC. You download, depending on the make of your camera, download the software, plug your, your USB into the port on the camera. <clears throat> you can control the, uh, the, uh, the images from your um, PC. More importantly, when you're checking for focus, um, you can, oh, I find it easier to, to focus using the computer screen than I do um, just using the little viewfinder in the live view. And then just see what you get. I mean, the, the night sky is superb for these sorts of objects. Try the end, um, the uh, Orion Nebula in the sword. Yeah, and just, you'll be pleased, please. And you'll be presently surprised with what you can get. Okay, I think finally, this is another one that I took um, with my digital SLR camera with a quad band filter. These are filters that are designed to fit inside the camera, just over the, the, the sensor, uh, and they just clip into place. And I used a wide field lens, but this time I was using uh, a tracking mount. And you just get this really, really beautiful wide field view. This is a H2 region. This is excited hydrogen um, in the constellation of Cygnus. Um, it's vast. There, and there are lots of these regions. They're, they're catalogued under the Sharpless catalog. Um, Google Sharpless, uh, Wikipedia, and that will give you a link to the catalog if you want to start hunting these things down. You will need a filter. Um, yeah, and the, the pleasing thing about this is I told you about the bubble nebula. This is the Crescent Nebula. And this is a wolf rayet star, um, which is a large, youngish star, but it's going undergoing violent change. Um, and that's what we're seeing here. This, this 
outward pouring of shell of gas as it's shedding its layers of atmosphere. So yes, I'd give it a go. <clears throat> and if you're interested, email us at inquiries at and we'd love to look at your pictures. Right, that's me. Oh, and don't forget the, the fun day, um, Sunday, if you're in the area, please come in and visit us. Right, I'm gonna stop me share now, Mike. Okay, right. I'll show right. you. Okay, myself. can you hear me all right? Yes, great, Mike. Yeah. Right, I'm going to mute myself. Okay. Um, if I share my screen. Right. Can you can you see that? That's uh, M1. It's all right. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> oh, okay. Great. Thanks. Um, Right, okay. Uh, well, I've got uh, a number of um, uh, nebulae and so on, and, and a few uh, uh, shots of galaxies and so on to show you, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll get on fairly quickly. Um, this is the, uh, the first uh, nebulae the, that uh, Messier catalogued, um, uh, M1, it's the Crab Nebula. Um, what I... Uh, uh, did with this actually i i, I took a, a number of shots and uh, uh this one was actually taken with what's called the ellen hans filter uh and that picks out all the uh, uh hydrogen uh, uh emission areas and so on so um uh you can actually see an awful lot of the uh, the structure in internally um and i took a uh similar one but this this was actually with the uh what's called an l pro filter uh which is uh, mainly uh, used for uh galaxies and so on and it's very good for cutting through um uh, light pollution uh, local light pollution and so on uh, the crab nebula is uh, is uh, really interesting actually it's 6500 uh, 6, uh, light years away um it was actually uh, spotted by Chinese uh, astronomers back in uh, uh, 1054. Uh, they called it the guest star because it uh, was actually visible during during daylight. Um, it, uh, it it was a, a massive uh, uh, star which uh, went supernova, uh, and the the resulting um, uh, core uh, is a neutron. Uh, it's a neutron star, uh, it, and it is it, actually spinning really fast, um, and it's uh, throwing out uh, radio uh, pulses and so on. It's a pulsar, and it's actually rotating at thirty times a second, which is absolutely really really fast. Um, the interesting thing is it's been observed. Uh, uh, uh you know obviously over many years but uh there there was a, a number of photographs taken one a year for about 20 years uh and you can actually see uh the whole uh nebula expanding uh they they put it together as a movie and it you can actually see it expanding so it's worth looking and looking out for that on the internet um the other interesting thing about this uh, pulsar, of course, is that it, it was generating a lot of radio waves. And uh, uh, back in 1955, uh, Burke and Franklin in uh, Washington, D.C., were uh, uh, set up a radio, uh, a radio telescope to uh, examine and listen to the, the pulsar. Um, they... Uh, it, it was working, but they were starting to get some very strange uh, uh, interference, and they couldn't understand this. And it it took them about six months of analysis and so on, because this interference kept moving, and it didn't didn't really follow where the uh, um, the, uh, uh, the crab nebula was. And eventually, this they've uh, realized that the radio interference was coming from Jupiter. And this was the first time that they realized that Jupiter itself, the magnetic fields around Jupiter, were, were causing uh, radio emissions. So 
Jupiter itself is actually a, a radio pulsar. <laughs> so it's, it's quite an interesting bit of history there. So anyway, um, so uh, let's uh, carry on then. Um, I showed this last night. Um, this is actually the Orion Nebula. Uh, you can see the three adult stars here. Um, it was it was only taken with a um, uh, a DSLR and a, and a fifty millimeter millimeter lens. Um, but what I was after was trying to get this uh, uh, loop here, which is called Barnard's loop. Um, now this it actually took thirty five minute shots uh, at a, uh, at a, uh, a very high ISO setting. Uh, to actually pick anything out. So it's a really, really faint object. Uh, it's about 10 degrees across. So you're talking uh, 20 full moons across uh, this object. So it's it's very large in the sky. Um, and well, the, the interesting thing actually is that um, uh, if if you, you look in here, you've got uh, the... Um, the flame nebula that uh, Dave was showing and the uh, horsehead nebula. And this is the um, Orion nebula itself. So the, this is about a 1300 uh, light years away. And it's actually the, the uh, closest star form forming region to, to Earth. Um, so let me just, uh, if I can find it. Uh, ah, yes. Uh, so this is the Orion Nebula that I showed there. Uh, and you've also got uh, an associated neb nebula to it. It was called the uh, uh, the running, running Man Nebula. And if you look at that, you can actually see uh, what appears to be a running man. OK, uh, this, this was taken with my uh, uh, six inch uh, uh, re reflector telescope. Uh, 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 some while ago. Um, the uh, the other interesting thing about the uh, Orion Nebula uh, is the actual core of it. Um, this was taken uh, with uh, an awful lot. Uh, I think it was something like uh, 80 or 90 uh, very uh, short exposures. Uh, so that it didn't overexpose and I, I was what I was after was finding or getting the trape the four trapezium stars in the middle um so let's say this is right in the in the middle of the um uh, Orion nebula the interesting thing is that uh just in the last couple of weeks the James Webb Space Telescope has actually found what they call jumbos in the middle of this uh, group of stars this was uh, Jupiter mass binary objects, they, they're called jumbos. Uh, they're actually uh, ga gaseous planets around uh, around the size of, uh, of Jupiter, but they're in pairs and they found about four or five pairs of these and they're not associated with any particular star. Uh, they seem to be free floating and uh, nobody can actually understand what uh, what these objects are or how they formed uh, uh, where they came from. So uh, that's uh, something fairly recent. OK, um, let me just go on to uh, another um, uh, very big uh, uh, item in the sky. Um, this is called the Veil Nebula. Um, it's uh, uh, it's about um, uh, well, it, it was actually caused by a, a, a massive uh, 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 star exploding in in the center, and these are actually all the shock waves going out through um, the, uh, the 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 uh, interstellar medium. Um, it's actually about three de three degrees across. So again, we're talking about sort of uh, six uh, full moons across, okay, um, and it's it's about uh, uh, or two thousand four hundred uh, light years away, but uh, this was a, a again a, a relatively difficult picture to get because it's so it's such a big item. Um, what I've had to do is actually stack three 
uh, pictures together. Um, each it, each picture was a, a stack of about uh, 20 or 30 frames, and then I had to stitch them together uh, uh, to actually get a, a mosaic composite of the uh, uh, of the uh, the system. So, okay. Um, so let's have a, a look at a couple of other nebulae. Um, this one, oh, why didn't that come out onto, hang on a second, that should have come onto here, right. Uh, this, is, this one is called the, uh, the Owl Nebula, as you can see, it seems to be a, uh, an owl's beak and two eyes and so on. Again, it's a planetary nebula, um, the central star there is a, uh, a white dwarf, which uh, has blown off all its uh, out, outer layers, and uh, these these are the the outer the outer layers expanding out into the interstellar medium, and that will dissipate over um, over time. Um, okay, uh, one that uh, Dave just showed. Uh, he showed the uh, the bubble nebula. This is actually a close up of the bubble bubble nebula. Um, it's uh, it's actually caused by the solar wind from uh, a very uh, young, very hot star in the center. Um, the this star is is they believe is some something in the region of 40, 44, 45 uh, times the size of our sun. Um, and it's uh, it's very active and it's throwing out an, an awful lot of uh, uh, material and so on. And, and that's what you're seeing is the the boundary of that material in the uh, in the uh, surrounding interstellar medium. OK, um, there was uh, another one that Dave showed, actually, which was the the Crescent Nebula. Again, this is a, a close up of it. And again, this is the the, the Wolf Rayup star that uh, uh, that uh, he was he was talking about there. It's um, uh, let me just go on to the next one. Okay, now this one um, is uh, NG, NGC seven three eight zero. It's actually it's called the uh, the Wizard Nebula, and uh, it's actually very difficult to see visually. Um, you'd, you'd need really dark skies and probably uh, an oxygen O3 uh, or an O2 filter uh, to be able to see anything, uh, anything at all. Uh, but with a, um, uh, a camera and the um, L-enhanced filter and so on, it really picks out all of the hydrogen emission areas and so on. Um, this is actually illuminated by a, a pair of uh, a massive O-type stars. That's the biggest stars uh, as around. They're very, very bright uh, blue, very young stars, and that's actually illuminating the whole of uh, uh, of, of this uh, this region. Okay, um, so let's uh, let's go on to a few of the uh, uh, galaxies and uh, and so on. Um, so if I can find it, right. Um, this, uh, this was a, an interesting one. This is uh, M101. Um, it's uh, uh, actually called the Pinwheel Galaxy. Um, and you may have heard uh, back in uh, May, uh, there was a supernova close, close by. Now, if you look here, this here is the, uh, the supernova. So um, let me just show you this. Uh, this shot was actually a, a shot I happened to take uh, uh, towards the end of April. Um, and uh, this one was uh, 22nd of May, which was two, two days after the, um, uh, the supernova was found. So you, you can see, see the supernova here, um, but in the earlier uh, shot, all you can see is a very faint red uh, area there, which was uh, uh, probably the emissions around the the star just before it was a before it went uh, supernova. And these were uh, various uh, uh, shots that I took 
in the subsequent months, you could see that it's uh, it was still bright here. But around about by August, it was beginning to dim. And uh, uh, earlier on this, uh, in October, uh, it's it's almost back to the uh, original. So so it, it is more or less died died down. Um, this supernova itself was uh, classed as a, a type two supernova, which was uh, again a, a star which is considerably bigger than the, it's probably uh, in the region of ten or twenty times as the size of the sun uh, that uh, that went bang. And the result is probably a uh, either a um, black hole or possibly even a uh, a neutron star. So, okay. Um, so uh, another another galaxy. The, this is the uh, the classic um, uh, one that uh, people like like photographing. Is actually two interacting galaxies. Uh, this is M fifty one. And it's um, uh, it's I think it's 127 million light years away, so it's it's quite a quite a long way away. Uh, this uh, associated galaxy has actually passed through the outskirts of uh, of the main galaxy, and they believe it's actually in the process of turning around and and coming back uh, uh, back in uh, on a collision course. Um, the other interesting thing about uh, M51 uh, is that uh, it's the first time they've actually managed to identify a planet in a uh, another galaxy. Um, this was a, a, a planet which actually traversed across a, a star which was very bright in X-rays and they saw a dip uh, in the brightness of the X-rays and they were able to identify uh, the effect as being a planet uh, rotating around that that star so somewhere in this region here uh, you've uh, you, you've actually got a uh, an extra galactic planet which uh, it, it blows your mind really okay um another couple of uh, quick um, uh, galaxies uh, this one is actually relatively close uh, to us. It's only 12 million light years away. It's called the um, uh, Bode's Galaxy M81, um, and it's 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 quite a nice uh, spiral. Uh, there's no central bar or anything. It's just a uh, 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 a normal a normal spiral galaxy with two main spiral arms. Um, the associated uh, galaxy, well, they thought that this galaxy originally was part of the local group, part of our uh, uh, and Andromeda, you know, Milky Way and so on group. Uh, but uh, they recently have, sh have shown that it is actually outside. It's not actually part of our group. Uh, but it does have an associated galaxy, um, which is, if I can get it there, uh, this is this is called the cigar galaxy. We're we're seeing it edge on here, uh, but that's actually termed as a starburst galaxy. It's really uh, highly active and so on. Um, it doesn't show it very well in here, but uh, I know David has got got some beautiful shots with shows the uh, uh, plumes of um, uh, hydrogen uh, gas and so on. Uh, uh, from from the uh, the central supermassive black hole, um, it, it 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 it's actually um, they've actually found uh, what they believe is actually the the brightest uh, pulsar uh, that, that's ever been detected in in this galaxy. So it really is a a, a very active galaxy. Okay. Um, let me see this one. Right, this this one was a. Uh, it's not as good an image as I would like because I actually took it through through high cloud and so on. Um, but it's uh, an NUC six six nine four six. Um, this is uh, it's actually called the fireworks galaxy, um, and it's it's a, really is well named. Um, there's been. Uh, uh, at least 10 supernovae 
detected in this galaxy in the last hundred years. So, so it, again, it's a, it is a really uh, uh, active uh, active galaxy. And all right, and I think uh, have I shown? Oh, I haven't shown shown this one actually. This is called the Needle Galaxy. Um, it's um, about 50 million light years away. Um, and it, it, it's really a, a very edge on galaxy. You can see the, the dust lanes uh, uh, across the middle. Um, so again, that's, that's a, a, a classic that we tend, tend to use for uh, 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 imaging and so on. Okay, so that was that was my uh, 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 galaxies and so on. Uh, I thought you might actually be interested in this shot here. Um, recently, you've presumably heard about the um, uh, Osiris Rex mission to um, the asteroid Bennu um, and returned a sample from it. Uh, when the uh, Osiris Rex uh, uh, deposited its uh, uh, its uh, canister uh, back. It, it's now going on to actually rendezvous with a another um, asteroid. Now this is a um, uh, a quite uh, what what they term a, a local or, or a, a dangerous um, asteroid called Apophis. Um, and our Apophis, where it's uh, it's a mass uh, a massive asteroid, and um, back in March in 2021, uh, it uh, crossed the Earth's uh, orbit and passed between Earth and the Moon. Uh, and this was a shot I took uh, of Apophis. Now, uh, what you're seeing here, I took um, 30 uh, uh, two-minute shots. Uh, of uh, of this, uh, and you can see that it, it actually moved in that time. Uh, the gaps in there are the uh, where I had to throw some of the images away because of sat satellites and so on corrupting them. Um, but anyway, th this was say so this was the shot uh, back in 2021. Uh, the problem is, of course, that Apophis is actually on a short orbit. Uh, and it's going to um, come very close to Earth again in 2029. Uh, actually, April the 13th. I'm not sure if it's a Friday, but um, uh, it will uh, uh, pass very close. So close, in fact, it will be inside some of the orbits of our artificial satellites, uh, certainly inside some of the... Um, uh, the geostationary uh, uh, satellite orbit. So they uh, they believe that the chances of it actually hitting Earth are, are relatively slim at the moment. But uh, that, that of course depends on nothing else disturbing its uh, its orbit in the meantime. So anyway, uh, Osiris Rex is going out to actually rendezvous with this and have a look at it and uh, see if they if they needed to move it and so on like the on the dart missions and so on uh then um uh, they, they'd have a bit more information on it so anyway dave uh, that's uh that's all uh, i've got uh, got to show if that's all right okay thank you very much mike um <clears throat> yeah very interesting very interesting it is Friday the 13th, 2029. Oh, did you hear that, uh, Mike? Sorry, Hutchins no, I didn't. Just, Mike Hutchings has just confirmed it will be Friday the 13th of April, 2029. Oh, it is a Friday. Oh, boy. So, oh, <laughs> joking. Do you think we better cancel our meeting that night? <clears throat> anyway, look, I, I'm very sorry to report that uh, the weather is appalling here. We have got very, very heavy rain. There is no sign of it clearing. So I'm going to wind things up now and say thank you, everybody who's online watching us. Uh, Mike, thank you very much um, for sharing your pictures with us. Uh, I shall say good night, and uh, I shall probably speak to you tomorrow night, Mike. Okay. Okay. Yeah.